Welcome, everybody. We are, again, gathering for an exciting workshop on tips and techniques for sketching birds. We'll start things off in a couple seconds. Allow some people to get on. OK, so um, we're joined today with by Gary Bloomfield, who is a wildlife artist and illustrator working primarily in ink or transparent watercolor and specializing in birds. He holds a bachelor's degree in scientific illustration from Humboldt State University. Published work appears in educational coloring books, various brochures, pamphlets, posters, maps, interpretive signs and displays, and educational and nonfiction books. His work can also be seen on numerous t-shirts. Interested in birds for about as long as he can remember, Gary did not start actively birding until he was nine, but since then he has been an avid birder and occasional field ornithologist. He has lived in Arcata since 1980. And I don't think you can go very many miles without seeing an illustration of Gary popping up somewhere in Arcata, Eureka or further areas away. So welcome Gary. Thank you, Bob. And so, yeah, and welcome everyone. And so I'm going to basically be you know, running this, this a lot like I would do with my live ones with doing some demonstrations and talking about what they start up like some of the reasons to do sketching and, and some materials and then a, like a crash course in bird anatomy. So first of all, in this this age of of digital everything, there's there's often the question why even be even to be doing field sketching, and it's really interesting that there's almost like a resurgence. It's like a uh, I'm thinking it's almost a backlash against everything being digital, and and there's more nature journaling clubs starting up, and it's. I think it, one of the reasons is it it brings you know everything to uh, um, a more primal experience you know if you will, and that writing something down or drawing really burns a memory into your in, into your brain, and you know, more so than taking a photo. Not that I don't take lots of photos. I take you know many many re reference photos where almost wherever I'm hiking or anything. Uh, but I also like to at least scribble something into a sketchbook. I could, you know, this is, I'll show you. Um, I'm going to switch to my, my camera here. And and so, oh, let's see, can everybody see? This is my typical field sketchbook. Does it sound good? Sounds wonderful. Okay. Okay. I'm, you know, now, you know, I'm calling this my field sketchbook, but it, it, be, it becomes just, you know, all kinds of... This is actually some sketches I did on a camp, camping trip. And I like to work with uh, ink and watercolor, even in my sketchbook. Here's some some bird bird things, and oh, this was just recent recently, you know, from the the lesser nighthawk that was found over the Hammond Bridge. Oh, and this another thing is a sketchbook really brings brings the memories back in a way that just looking through photos can, but not as much. Like this this then the next night I went back and didn't see the nighthawk but I got to watch an otter actually a couple otters uh, not sharing a lamprey one of them had it and was just thoroughly enjoying it and the other one was looking on but and so anyhow as far as materials I like to say that the best best materials are the ones you have with you you know, if you carry a pencil or any kind of any kind of pen, even a 
a ballpoint pen can be your your media medium of choice and you know anything that you have with you and as far as sketchbooks or you know I you know in my at home or in my studio I like to have a somewhat larger or at least eight and a half by eleven size in the field this is like a five by eight hardcover one so that if you work in pencil one of the benefits of hardcover is you know it, it doesn't the pages don't smear like they do with a spiral bound that's not so much a problem in a studio where you can use some sort of fixative and and there are some healthier ones than there used to be now Let's see, one of the things I like to show is a little inspiration. Charles Tunnicliffe is one of you know, the, let's see, one of the best, best known uh, bird sketchers. And he was around, around the, let's see, what are his dates? You know, you know, the early early twentieth century. But, but he really was a, a master of of, of of sketching. He would often start some sketches in the field, and and then they'd do follow ups in in his studio. Sometimes he would. See if there's good examples of yeah, these are some really nice just gesture gestural sketches. And then probably finished up in the studio to make a more polished study. Another really interesting reference is, is this book called The Unfeathered Bird. This is a book by Katrina McGraw. And it's, it's, she, she did all of these wonderful drawings of skeletal or muscular drawings, you know, in lifelike positions, which is really, really unique. And, this is just a wonderful book. This way to show the the different different views of a bird in the same drawing. It's a Gen two penguin, yeah, you know, leaping out of the water, but in just muscular view. Again, really inspirational stuff for starting to think about anatomy. And so that said. See. Where did that go? There we go. I keep this uh, this notebook, you know, uh, you know, file of just all kinds of references, you know, that I've found. Of, And that's a helpful thing too, just to be able to have your own references at your fingertips. Also, so, and I mentioned taking photographs. You know, this is you know one, one uh, job I was on doing, you know, working near an oil, oil spill. There were a lot of you know birds that unfortunately succumb to that or or, the, or other causes, but. I mean, this is a, a skeleton of a rhinoceros awkward. And this is a rhinoceros awkward that's still got all of its feathers. In. And you can see that in life, of course, a rhinoceros awkward has, you know, no, not much of a visible neck. But when you look at 
the skeleton, you can see it's got that long, long S-curve of the neck like all birds have. And so that can bring us to, you know, thinking in terms of what, how, to, how to draw birds. Okay, so anyhow, birds have, all have a, a very similar basic body plan. So a blob of a head, a blob of a body, and an, an S-curve neck that connects them. And then the skeletons. The pelvis back here. Somewhere right up in here is going to be where the hip, the legs attach. So you have a, a femur, then going to the tibia tarsus. You have that. And, and one thing to point out here is it's very much You know, the same basic plan as, let's see, like back here, as a, a human. Yeah, you know, we have the same, the same bones, but just in different proportions and often held differently. So what, you know, where you see what the heel of a bird is that long joint that looks like what people often say, hey, the bird's knee is backwards. It's not backwards at all. The knee is back way up here. And they're often hidden, you know, by feathers. And you almost you almost never see the knee on a bird. But down down here where the heel is, and then these this is the, the foot and the toes. And the one that comes backwards is you know, the equivalent of, you know, big toe, big toe or thumb that goes backward. So that's the, the three, the three toed look of a, of a modern dinosaur. And, you know, and the back, the back toe is variable depending on, you know, a raptorial bird. Or, you know, it's very obvious. Some sandpipers have it almost disappeared completely. And something like an ostrich is reduced to just two toes. So that's roughly the, what the leg does. Then you have a joint up here for you know, the shoulder. You know, upper arm bone comes down there. Then the forearm bone and the hand. The skull up there. And at this point, you kind of have to decide what you're drawing. Since this is Godwit days, let's sort of fine tune this into a Godwit. If, you know, if we have, if we're actually looking at a godwit, you know, it's, it, they're going to have a little bit longer proportion than, just, just quickly get rid of that. One thing is when you're sketching, is I actually would discourage you from doing using too much eraser. Now, one thing about the, where the wings are, I've 
again, I'd like to go back to this illustration here. Here is a pigeon. And again, you can see this is just with the wings going up instead. So it's, you still have the elbow there, the wrist, the hand, and all of the primaries, all the primaries attached to the hand. All of the secondaries, including the tertials, attached to the forearm. So then what you have the, is un it's kind of a, a gap in here on the humerus. And why don't you see that in birds? That's because the axillary feathers and the scapulars, they all fill in that whole gap. And then there's also this patagium, the membrane that connects you know, between the shoulder and the wrist. And that fills in that gap. So you get you know, the general shape of the bird's wing. In the hand. You know, the forearm. Again, with the feathers all coming out from there. And then you have axillaries filling in the gap here. Now, birds. All, all modern birds don't have a long bony tail. You have to go back at, you know, at least into the Cretaceous to, to get some birds that will still have that. But, but they have a, a variety of tail lengths and shapes that all attach to this pygostyle, you know, the little, the little bit of a bony tail that is there. So depending on birds, it can be, be long or short. It's, but all the feathers come off of that. Now, one thing is in a bird's skull, the eye is really big. But you don't see the whole eye. You only see maybe that much of it. But in the skull, it's a big socket to hold the eye. That's why it, it, it really does help to look at a lot of skeletons if you get the chance. Here's another another look at to reinforce that that concept of how the hand and arm form the areas for the primaries and secondaries, the feather groups. So again, putting that into practice, you can. Maybe the other wing, just start off with, you know, the, the upper arm, forearm, and hand. And you can see how things just sort of start to come together. Now, how does all this work? Really? In terms of the field, uh, uh, often, let's see, here's where, let me see if I can, I can do share content, photos,
Okay, never mind. That's not good. <laughs> that wasn't. <laughs> I thought that was going to be easier to do with them. That's all right. Um, so what I'd like to do here is just give a, a sample of a photo. And show some ideas. Here is a vermilion flycatcher. And so you can see, you get an idea of what the head, the skull is doing up in there. First, you, you can block in the basic, basic shape first, the body. But then you sort of, you, it's always nice to double check. You know, think that skull in there attaches with, with a little bit of an S curve to the, to the, the body, which is always a lot smaller than you think it is, because you know everything that you're seeing is feathers. And here's where you can, you know, look at the contours and try to, to envision what the angles are. You know, as you, you can see it's a little bit bushier on the back, on the crest. You can add that in. You know, when you're initially laying in, try not to get distracted by, by all the color patterns and, and, and those, because they're pretty much external. You can you can add them in, but you want to get that internal stuff first, and then just block in pattern. Now, in the legs, you know it could be confusing. You look like you want to just stick them out of the body, but again, always try to remember where they might originate. Like it's right up in here is where the mass of the body is. So the hip would be up in here. Now the knee way up there. Then it comes back. Kind of like that. So that's roughly what this bird is doing. And then the, the tail would be attached to there, getting about like that. And then the wing, you want to remember how it, birds hold their wings bent like that. It's sort of the grasping, grasping motion, which, which evolved into a flying stroke. And so again, the primaries come off of the hand Secondaries come off of from there in the forearm, and you have scapulars covering over that, and everything overlaps. Yeah, you know, and then at that point you can start to to, to look at patterns. Again, now one of the things that that really helps to think of in, when you're adding feathers in is the way they overlap. You know, think of think of birds' feather groups and in and individual feathers as like shingles on a roof. They they all overlap. But the upper ones over the, the you know the you know scapulars will overlap. Uh, coverts, coverts will overlap or 
you know, lesser coverts and medial coverts will overlap. Greater coverts, greater coverts will overlap secondaries, and the secondaries overlap the primary. So sometimes in a lot of birds, when their wings are folded, you won't even see the primaries at all, or just a slight bit of them. You know, going back to our uh, flycatcher here. Oops. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, so going back to the, this vermilion flycatcher, let's see. Trying to get a better light on it here. You can see where the, the feathers overlap up in here. And and having a feel for these, for the, what the groups of feathers are, is really helpful. There are, there are numerous sources. Every field guide has the bird topography section. And that's something that a lot of people, you know, and here's, here's of course, Sibley. He has a, a really great bird, topo bird, bird topography opening, where all of the feather groups are specified. And this is, of course, useful as, you know, for birders to be able to describe, you know, the, the patterns and colors on a bird or the shapes of the feather groups. But, but that all really makes it a huge help for drawing birds as well, is to review what, what the feather groups are and different, different groups of birds and how they look different. I'd really recommend you know digging into that that part of of any field guides you have around. They're even in the uh, electronic versions on your on your phones. If you if you dig around, you find the find the it right in there too. Let's see where was. Yeah, I'll just go back into in here. Again, David Sibley did a really nice job of of showing how the wings look in different positions. Now there's the fold, folded, folded wing versus a slightly opened wing versus a fully extended wing. And again, if you it's it's really easy to to just go back and remember, like if, if you're drawing a, a bird's outstretched, where did I put my pencil? Oh, well. Always good to have extra pencils. From, a, from, the, from the above, primaries and all of the wing feathers will overlap from the inside over over the outside. Um, you know, if anyone's familiar with there's some of the some of the coverts for for some unknown reasons and different birds actually overlap in a different direction in the middle there. And no one that I've ever talked to you know about this knows why. Anyhow, that's that's just the exception that makes the rule, as they say. And so from the underside, it's the other way. And again, it's, it's easy to remember this because if you think of the wing being used as an umbrella in the rain to keep the rest of the bird dry, that's how the, the the rain doesn't leak into the feathers, it drops down, and, and because of the, the feathers being oiled properly, they, it sheds like nice rain gear. And doesn't soak into the feathers and get the body cold. So, let's see, now, 
one of the f I'm just going to look for a, a sample of a different type of bird just to see and see what's going on. Here. Oh, before I dig out some other things, I would like to really give a, a good, a great recommendation to um, to this book by John Muir Laws, you know, Drawing Birds. This came out a few years ago, and you know, if I were teaching teaching this as an extended course, I would definitely want to make this the textbook. I mean, he included a lot of, a lot of the basics, and and goes into some of the anatomical details. So, anyhow, I think we can put this into the into the notes too. Okay. So now, now I was going to look, dig into this file here. Find out. Okay. So the next little little demo, I want to include something about fly, flying bird. So, so here is a tropic bird. You can see, first of all, you want to try to figure out what's going on with the bird. You know, the head, it looks like it goes straight onto the body, but and you just have to just remember intellectually that there is that an S curve in there, but it might be a little bit stretched out, or not. It's, sometimes you have to watch and observe birds from the different ways, and then you see where the hand is, the arm, the axillaries to fill the gap, and then the wrists there. So, the way I would start some, you know, something like this would just be to, you know, get get the body blob in there, the head blob. It's probably a bit of a, you know, that might be how the head is connecting there. Get the skull. where the, the hips are in, in, in that body back there. And with a lot of birds when they're flying, you know, it's, it's tricky to sometimes figure out what they're doing with their legs. Often they'll be, you know, the knees will be tucked up. You know, and then the leg, you know, that's the leg comes down up there and then and so they'll all be folded up and then tucked on inside all the feathers to make them more aerodynamic. This comes up here, and, you know, from the shoulder, goes to the elbow, and the elbow goes up to the wrist. You need a darker pencil. Darker pencil. From the, from the wrist. Again, the primaries come up. You can get that, you see the general shape of the, of what it looks like. You can sort of block that in lightly and fill, fill that in. Then the patagium, that membrane connects and makes the wing look straighter along here. 
You can see the other, see the, the right wing from the behind comes up and goes behind there. Same thing though, there's, there's the hand and there's the other part of the forewing. And it's sort of going back, so you're not, you know, down here you're not even seeing the primary stick out there, but if the wing was in a slight different position, it would. So just knowing where things are. And again, there's tertials on the top, axillaries on the underside, fill this gap in here. And the tail. And you can see a little suggestion of some of the feet coming out here. So, so that gives an idea of how the wings are fold, how it's folded. And then you can see the you know the tails. You can actually um, use the birds body as a reference. You can see, you can use your pencil to measure, you know, how long the tail plume sticks out you know, from the body. It looks like it's right about to where the bill, the bill ends. So you can take that measurement here and bring that out to here. I know that right about here is where where the tail streamer ends. That's a useful technique, and that's that's the thing that's behind you know when you when you see people you know the, the caricatures of artists holding a you know a, you know a pencil out and then you, uh, you know and then the dramatic pose of measuring measuring that dis the distance on what they're looking at and then transferring that to the paper. Okay, how are we doing on time? Let's see. Oh, good. Okay, now one of the things that that I find really useful is to, you know, if you're working from a live a live bird like. Oh, let's see. I'm going to end this up up right now. And so I'm looking out at our um, at our bird feeder outside my studio window right now. We've got some sparrows and finches coming in. And so one of the things that I like to do for sketching in the field. Is let's see. I'm grabbing my binoculars here. I always keep them handy by my studio, which is why I get most of my work done at night. But okay, there's a couple pine siskins out there right now, and a fox sparrow. So the fox sparrow is, it has back to me, so I'm, quick, I'm just quickly doing a quick gesture drawing. Okay, and it took off, so I'm not going to go any farther than that. That's what I have there for it. I'm going to just wait and see if something else comes back. And if it's not, if the fox sparrow doesn't come back, I might start this pine siskin. And again, just, you know, in, in quick field sketching, you just try to get a suggestion of something. Maybe the bird will go into a different position. And just get lots of stuff written, you know, onto the page. 
maybe, and then when someone in the bird comes back into the same position for a second time, you can come in and add to it and say, oh, okay, I see what it's doing with its feet there. Or, or I can see how, you know, maybe the breast feathers are coming up over the wing a little bit, or, or vice versa. Maybe, maybe the, the wings dropped a little bit. But, you know, those are the little details that you can just sort of look at and make suggestion, suggestions of as you're going along. And having that underlying knowledge of what, what, the, what the bones are like and the muscles and the layers of feathers. We've got a, a couple of white-throated sparrows now. And so that's always a, a kind of fun to look at them. It goes you know, to a different side. You have a look from the back. And if they, you know, come back into the same position, you know, then and one thing to remember is, just doing loose sketches like this, they don't have to look like, you know, anything special. It, it's, you know, it's just done for yourself in a, in a sketchbook. If you happen to turn it into something more elaborate, that's great. But that doesn't have to be the main goal when you're, when you're sketching something. And like anything else, the more you do it, the better it'll you'll you'll get at it, and the more easily things will come to you. It's easier to take shortcuts, and and again, practicing you know with references makes a huge difference. So anyhow, I, what I'd like to do right now is uh, if there's any questions in, in the Q and A, uh, I'd like to you know open it up and and. and just have answer answer questions that people might have and see what directions we can go in from there. Oh, okay. No questions. I think we're all fascinated by what you're doing. <laughs> I would have said you have answered so many questions about how you put that together. I remember when Sibley was here, he did a drawing class just like you did, and he talked about the structure, the bone structure, and then for especially for like sparrows, etc. Mm -hmm. Do go off of those to create the other birds. Very interesting, Gary. Thank you. You're welcome, well, Alex. And so, there, yeah, did anyone have any specific you know, questions about uh, you know, legs, wings, tails, bills, or? There was one question in the Q&A that they'd be interested in seeing you sketch some feather contour or shading. Oh, okay. Yeah, that, no, that's an, another uh, you know, whole part of, of drawing and in general is just practicing drawing skills. You know, if, you know, if you have a, you know, again, you know, knowing that then we got a, a raven here. You know, raven's all black. And so you don't have to worry about any patterns. And we'll still, still think about the, the underlying skeleton. The S curve you know, is, is kind of looks different if a bird has its head turned. But as far as the feathers, 
Again, think of the, the, fe the way the feather tracks overlap. You know, scapulars will come down. You know, at the wrist. You know, and, and just remembering you have this overlap. You know, you can, you know, like any, any other drawing, you can have the parts that are shaded a little bit, you know, where they're tucked under. Is that, is that kind of what you're thinking of the, 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 with the question? You know, anything that's that's underneath is you know, can draw a little bit darker. You know, again, it's you know something that you know, becomes. We have a question that is about the legs. Just uh, wondering, are the legs outside the bird body but under the wings? Because that person thinks that the legs are sticking out from the bottom, but I know I unlearned. It says. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Again, uh, if you think in terms of the skeleton. Or, I think of you know, think think of uh, like from underneath, you know, where the the pelvis is, and where, the, and then the knees up there. Yeah, you know, this is an under under underside view of not any bird in particular. You know, they can look sprawled, but, you know, if they attach, you know, think of, think of how our hips attach to, to our body. It's not all that dissimilar. I mean, there's, of course, variation, but, you know, if they were directly underneath, that would, that would make balancing almost impossible, you know, if they were connected right near together. So they There's have a cool people. question for you. This person says, my name is Zara. I'm almost seven years old. How did you learn to draw birds? Oh, well, got Zara, several young people here today, actually. Yeah, that's a, a really great question. Um, first, start by just drawing everything you, you get. A, and and then if you really enjoy, enjoying birds, like anything else, the more the more you like something and and focus on it the more attention you pay to it and the more details you'll see on it and that's a really really a, a good way to to think about it is to just really just you know you know enjoying birds and enjoying drawing them just keep doing it as much as you can if you have a uh, oh let's see i mean you ever have the chance to look at a bird skeleton you know you know the thanksgiving dinner look at the turkey i don't know <laughs> or, or go to a museum and look at the bones you can learn a lot that way and and there's also now you know, examples of almost anything you would want to look at you know, online you can if you want to you know look at a um, a godwit skeleton you could probably do a search for that and come up with bunches of pictures at different angles, probably. And I'm just guessing here, but I'd you'd be surprised if you didn't get that. Um, There's also a question, uh, skeleton related to how, can you talk about how the beak is connected to the skull? Yeah, um, actually a good way to, yeah, the, the, the mandible, and Coleman, or the upper part of the bill, they're, let's see if I can find that quick. Let's see. Go back to my, yeah, here's a, a crow skull. Now this part is, is called the sheath that, that covers over. 
over the, the skeleton part of the bill. So, you know, if you have, a, yeah, let me get this up here. If you've, you've got the basic skull, really big orbit, that's the hole in the skull where the eye fits in. Then the, the lower part of it, the lower mandible attaches back here. And then there's a kind of like fingernail material almost. There's a, a sheath that fits over the bony part of the bill. And so that would, that's what makes the bill look heavier and, and what the way it looks in real life and when the bird is alive. But this brings me to another point I wanted to mention. So thank you for mentioning this. You know, if you, if you have a, a bird that, you know, that looks to your little cartoony and wrong if you try to open it like that. Because, or, you know, sometimes like that. Because even though the parts are feathered back here, the, the, you know, there may be feathers covering up all of this part. But the, oh, the mouth actually opens from back there. So when, you, when the bird opens its mouth, it'll look more like that. It's a little membrane hiding and feathers hiding where the joint is way back here. Okay, this row isn't. Is that making sense there? And so that way it makes it more look, look more realistic when a bird is shown with an open beak. And again this and to go back again just again the skeleton part of it is just sort of inside there. And like all animals skulls the skull is made up of different bones fused together. And some of the few, the areas where they come together are a little bit flexible. Like, um, it's called uh, uh, rhynchinesis is when the, the upper mandible can be raised up a little bit. That's especially obvious if you happen to watch parrots. You know, their upper, upper, upper mandible, it goes up with Coleman quite a bit. Kind of drawing over things. <laughs> Did that make any make sense? And answer your question, or did I go beyond it? Oh, I think we have more questions. Okay. Would you like another one? Of course. This person just arrived as you were talking about pens and pencils, and was wondering about what pencil you are using. Um, right now I'm using what are commonly called lead holders, and you know it's. You know, they can, you know, it's a real, real stout, stout lead. I like them. You can, they have different sharpeners for them. You can get a really nice point on them. You can also break them easily. There's also a question about if you have a favorite bird you like to draw. Oh gosh, <laughs> I I don't know. I, that, that's that would be tough. I don't. I don't think I would have one favorite bird to draw. Um, I do like do, uh, doing restorations of prehistoric birds because that has a chance to add um, a, a little bit of fantasy and speculation to what is known. And there have been such a wonderful wealth of new fossil birds being discovered, especially in China in the last number of years. So I'd have to say that might be some of my favorite kind of things to explore. 
How about this one? Is there any sort of building blocks we should master as we learn to sketch birds and be able to sketch them in the field? Like skeleton before muscles, muscles before gestures, gesture before feathers, etc. Oh, you know, I would say just to try to think of uh, all of them in general terms and maybe focus on one particular thing uh, when you're out doing it and, and maybe just focus on that and pay attention and then study later and you know when you get back 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 out of the field you look at some references and see okay what what did I do right what did I do that looks wrong how would I correct that and and go you know, from the, from there. Um, I don't know if that's if that's helpful. I, I certainly I, I sort of start from the inside out, and I think of terms of you know like you know in the same way that you can say that you know this is a, a, a stick figure of a person, but it doesn't really say much about a person. You could do the same thing with with birds. That would be the equivalent stick figure of a bird, but but if you start adding joints, you can know, it starts to tell a story, and then the same thing with with birds. So. And you just start adding in and you know and because with birds you you see more of the feathers and everything from you know, from the get-go you know it's sometimes easier to to not get stuck on just just doing a stick figure at first but you know oh wow Yeah. Um, some you know sometimes just you know trying to block in the, the initial shape of something. Right now I'm looking at some band-tailed pigeons on our feeder. So. <laughs> you know, again, you know things fly in. Just quickly blocking in shapes, and then you can come in with with the, the things that you you've studied, and figure out okay if it's birds roughly in that position, where would the the wing the bones be, where would the blob of the head be compared to the body, and that might be a good good way to start. And is that is that helpful? I think everything is so helpful. <laughs> That's all the questions that seem to be on there, but there's a wonderful comment about how Carol McNeil loves the, the binocular harness you created for her with the green hair and what it grew and, um, and so many thank yous and so many people delighted to be able to see the magic of what you create. <laughs> and several people, including children, are drawing alongside of you, Gary, so that's why they don't have questions. Oh, well, that's fantastic. Yeah. That was great. Um, yeah, actually. One thing I wanted to mention is that Gary draws all the time. He always has a sketchbook with him. And I think this is one reason you're successful is because if we're in the Gaba Days meeting when we used to not be on Zoom, you were always drawing a bird of one kind or another. So I think it's a constant being always constantly involved. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you for mentioning that, Alex. It's, yeah, I would I would say that that's definitely a, a big a big help to be able to just have a sketchbook going all the time. Whoops. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm juggling something here to help anyone who wants to try to do some some field sketching right now. I'm going to try to put the, the phone onto my scope here. Look at the band-tailed pigeons. So give me just a moment here. I don't know how much time we still have. think if we if I can get this on real quick here might be able to oops sorry <laughs> well that's the that's right you can't really zoom easily with this Anyhow. Well, Gary, we're a few minutes after two. Oh, okay. So it's about time to wrap it up anyway. Isn't it? Okay. All right. Well, um, yeah, it's, you know, if people have additional questions and, you know, the, you know, I'll think of them, you can always uh, make comments when you know when we get things loaded uh, on the YouTube channel, and we can reach you at Bloomfield Studios if we search for that on the internet. Yeah, Bloomfield Studio with you know singular, no s, okay. and it's Bloom Bloomfield Studio, and yeah, I've got. I'm working on setting up a, you know, a full website. Right now, I just have other examples about. But well, that's great. So, thank you, Gary. Okay. Well, that's my pleasure. Yeah, I'll, I can switch back to my regular view. <laughs> I can hear a loud applause. So nobody else can. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for for attending and being part of Godwood Days in general. Thank you. And Again, tune back in at five o'clock for a tribute to Stan Harris. Oh, yes. I just wanted to mention one thing: when you, if you go to the store and you want to buy a water bottle or whatever, you might just see um, those are Gary's designs on those um, shirts, hats, water bottles. Right, right. Thank you, Alex. Hey guys, just wanted to make one correction. Uh, just to the time for Doc celebration, it's actually six to eight p.m. Six to eight, thank you. Six to eight, yeah. Or six to eight or whenever it ends. We've got about 30 people that are gonna be saying something about Doc. So it should be a really wonderful celebration. Yeah, so and I suspect, hope to I see suspect, you there. Yeah, I suspect that even a lot more people will be in, inspired when they hear what people say and they say, oh, and it'll remind them of things and memories of, of Doc also. Yeah, for sure, hopefully so. And an encouragement for those who will be panelists, especially those who will share something um, graphically, it'd be good to get online early, so maybe 5.30 to 6, show up to make sure we test your audio and video and uh, screen share. So, thank you. And we'll end the meeting till then. All right. All right take care.